uh, I'm biased as an incident responder and subject matter expert and get called into these attacks. So I'd say first and foremost is have subject matter experts and listen to them. <laughs> um, you know, like, and, and I do see the, the value of uh, various DDoS mitigation vendors or third parties, because for a lot of organizations, um, their primary focus is not moving packets around. Uh, again, I am biased. I've worked for operators for almost two decades, so that is my primary focus. Um, and I find with um, with large complex networks, such as you know operators or internet service providers, while you obviously will have a third party or you know DDoS mitigation service uh, that you can rely on at some sort of partnership, I find for very large complex networks, you really do kind of need an embedded subject matter expert uh, to just understand not just the new threats that are coming from DDoS and what you got to do to mitigate them, but also to understand these super complex networks. Uh, because often attackers are going to find those little pain points that you haven't found. So you really do need a, a subject matter skilled expert on hand. And of course, they're going to work with third party vendors, um, you know, such as your own organization, Barry, and those, you know, those are invaluable as well. So as much as I might be a subject matter expert on DDoS on my network, you know, I look to folks like yourself and others on the panel here today to assist me when I'm actually going through those attacks because my subject matter expertise is mostly on DDoS on my network. Um, and I, I really look to people like yourself, you know, where you get a wider view of the overall kind of ecosystem of what's going on with DDoS. Um, and I think the third thing, which again is, you know, you probably heard it before is that, you know, I would encourage, you know, leadership to understand like technical debt, it's a real thing. Um, and you're either going to pay today or you're going to pay tomorrow plus suffer an outage, uh, which is probably going to cost you more. Um, so while I do understand that, you know, it is challenging for leadership and businesses to kind of allocate budget to something that may or may not ha happen and you may not have experienced yet, um, it, it's really one of those things that hindsight will definitely, you know, kind of prove that, oh, wow, we, we really should have looked at this before. Because I think for you know, most, or, most large organizations, specifically operators, it's not a matter of if, it's definitely a matter of when. Um, and as, you know, as other panelists may talk about, or as people may know, you know, DDoS attacks are, are growing in size uh, with our capacity, right? So it's a never ending fight. So, you know, it just, as hard as it is to allocate that budget, you're gonna end up allocating it one day anyway. So, you know, have your subject matter experts, um, listen to them and properly fund these DDoS mitigation. And then the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, su support your sub subject matter experts to develop those relationships, not with your formal partners and third party suppliers, but also the, the global DDoS, uh, anti-DDoS community at large. There's some great folks, including people on this panel that, you know, don't just spend their professional, but also their personal uh, time and effort to, you know, research and mitigate and assist others with these types of attacks. Great. Um, so, you know, one thing is just knowing how to identify a potential DOS attack and escalate it to the right teams. Um, I've, I've seen cases where, you know, maybe people didn't realize it was a DOS attack or they knew it was a DOS, but they didn't know how to escalate properly. Um, another thing is knowing how to gather data on the attack. Um, you know, gather as much information as you can. Also figure out who you can share it with. Um, you know, talk to your lawyers or your PR people, you know, figure out who you who you're allowed to share this with, because um, you might be able to get external help. Um, it's important to have some sort of PR response explaining that, you know, what you know about the attack, uh, you know, giving users information always makes them have a little bit more confidence. Um, also, it's important to mention in that, that data is safe. These attacks are really just an availability risk. It's not that any user data is at risk of exposure. Um, and another thing that I like to remind, especially smaller organizations, is to know your priorities. Um, you know, sometimes uh, you, you can keep your site up by sacrificing some portion of the site. Maybe there's expensive functionality. So like if, if you allow comments, you could disable comments and just have a static page there and that might mitigate the attack. There are also DOS mitigation services out there, but some may cost more than, uh, than it's worth to you, right? So I, I think it's also important to recognize that suffering a brief outage is maybe actually a legitimate uh, strategy in these cases. Well, uh, basically, uh, I, I think that 
uh, organizations don't necessarily pay attention to what what which of their resources they need to actually keep running uh, so uh, we see a lot of people protecting their websites and not remembering to protect their DNS servers. Uh, and then somebody who's smart will DDoS their DNS servers. Uh, and if the DNS doesn't reply, then it doesn't matter their website is still up because nobody can get its IP address and therefore nobody can visit it. So you have to think holistically about these issues. Uh, you can't just uh, buy a service or buy a bigger pipe or whatever to protect something. The other thing is to ask yourself whether or not you care, because if all that's on your website is brochures, uh, then uh, it doesn't really matter that if uh, somebody comes and knocks it offline. Uh, equally, if uh, all of your business is done through it, then you need to think through how you're going to protect it if somebody decides that uh, they're going to send you a lot of traffic. Uh, and the traffic may not be volumetric. Uh, the traffic may just be uh, that uh, they're turning up and downloading that five uh, megabyte uh, PDF uh, many, many times a second. And therefore, you need to design your system. You need to be able to control your uh, software so that uh, people can't do that sort of thing to you. If they have to fill in the capture, uh, before they get the PDF, then uh, basically it's really hard to, for them to automate. Not impossible, but hard. So you need to think these things through. And the other thing is that uh, many companies seem to think that they're being having a denial of service attack just because a lot of people turn up at the same time uh, because they make an announcement and everybody wants to download their fancy new PDF uh, to see what is going on and they DDoS themselves. Uh, so look at your traffic, understand what is normal, because if your website goes down and you dump the traffic, you may say, goodness me, look at all of this traffic, but that's normal. And what you actually want to do is worry about the fact that your website has gone down for something which is nothing to do with denial of service at all. Well, so understanding understanding your exposure and uh, with, with the applied understanding of uh, how... Uh, your network plumbing and internet plumbing works. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's uh, that's half of the win right there. And then uh, uh, once you actually uh, implemented the plan uh, and necessary protections, test. So tests, uh, tests are good. There's, uh, uh, there's plenty of uh, tools and crowds uh, who do that sort of stuff. You can do it in house. You can uh, get someone uh, to test it to ensure that actually your uh, controls actually working and then sort of uh, mm. uh, keep on uh, keep on improving on those. It's, uh, well, I mean, if uh, I if I had that magic wand, is if every single uh, internet provider would implement uh, BCP thirty eight. That will, uh, I would say, that's probably 70, 70 to eighty percent uh, of your uh, EDOS gone like that. I mean, you uh, you only left with your sort of direct uh, direct style attacks. So anything that uh, involves uh, uh, IP address spoofing, such as so like. Uh, like in TCP world, it's like uh, a TCP uh, scene attacks with spoofing and uh, TCP scene reflections in UDP. It's all the all those reflection amplification attacks. So NTP, DNS, uh, CLDAP, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> all of that will be gone. So that's uh, that's a lot uh, <laughs> a lot less uh, DDoS traffic to deal with. Yeah. That's that's quite an easy question. Uh, first of all, have uh, performance headroom, at least double. Mm. Then uh, have a nice and transparent metrics in sufficient amounts covering all layers of your application and business metrics. Um, keep uh, a list of uh, your network applications and the uh, critical level to your business and have mitigation scenarios in place prior to the DDoS attack. Mm. Really simple. So it, it's hard, right? Availability is hard. And availability is hard because it's multidisciplinary. You know, if you take a look at confidentiality and integrity, 
at base, they're based on a simple concept, crypto. Now, crypto is very hard to get right, but from a conceptual standpoint, it's easy to uh, to 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 do things like uh, you know uh, bureaucratic controls and using and, and the use of encryption technology. That's easy to explain to non-specialists. But when you get into availability, it's multifaceted. You have to understand all the layers of the OSI model plus layer eight, which is the internal politics. You have to understand how all the moving parts of the service and, and, and application and content delivery chain um, mesh together. And we, there've been, there's been a, a lot of success, I would say, over the last 20 years or so of getting organizations to take security from a confidentiality and integrity um, perspective more seriously. And so they incorporate um, security um, uh, from conf a confidentiality and integrity standpoint into their whole product project development lifecycle from initiation through testing through deployment through retirement and so there are folks who, who are really focused on those aspects of security involved at all aspects of the process but availability is actually arguably the most important aspect of security because if you don't have any availability I guess you've achieved perfect confidentiality and integrity because nobody can access anything and so Understanding that availability is this key component of security, that it's part of business continuity, and, and, and having that mindset when you're designing systems and building them and deploying them, whether it's a network, whether it is a, a, an application, whether it's some kind of framework that's going to be used for infrastructure you know, as a service or you know, some kind of CDN that you're building or, or, or what have you, uh, being able to, to say, I'm going to look at every aspect, every single element that meshes together um, to, to comprise the whole, and I'm going to game out how could an attacker attack it, right? How could they attack it at the network layer? How could they attack it at the connection layer? How could they, at the application layer, try to attack um, and disrupt this system? Um, and then from an architectural standpoint, um, build it so that uh, it is resilient by design. And then once the system itself end to end is resilient by design, implement all the best current practices with the network, with the ancillary supporting services like DNS to ensure that they are resilient by design as well. So it's kind of a complicated answer, but basically, I guess if I boil it, would boil it down, I would say, um, center availability, prioritize availability where it's viewed as being at least as important as confidentiality and, and integrity in the entire mm. pro project lifecycle. Mm.